Stefanos uh, IT company in Azumara in the 1990s. Uh, and then he'll be followed by Dr. David Stein, who is uh, from uh, the University of London at Bebe College. He is a professor of international uh, politics. He'll be presenting on uh, 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 improving uh, international cooperation and also diaspora engagement. And finally, will be Michael Tesfazgi, who is uh, in Australia, will be presenting on uh, mining and sustainability, sustainability in uh, Eritrea. But I'm not sure uh, because I just received an email from Michael that he has been out in uh, field work. So if Michael doesn't show up, then I'll take over uh, his presentation. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. I am going to talk about uh, building human and the institutional capacity in Eritrea. My presentation will cover four main areas of capacity building. I'll talk about training people, effectively mobilizing and utilizing, improving their skills and knowledge and uh, retaining them. But to give you a general perspective and in line with the objectives of this conference, the presentation is divided into three sections. First, I'll talk about the challenges, then the opportunities, then I'll discuss uh, the short and long-term recommendations. Start with the challenges. I assume we all agree that uh, human resources is an important aspect of a nation, particularly as Eritrea. But Eritrea lacks, uh, or Eritrea has lack of qualified human resources, especially if you see the tertiary education gross enrollment rate, gross enrollment ratio, I mean, it is less than 4%. Secondly, migration and the mismanagement has crippled the available human resource of the country. As we all know now, Eritrea is one of the sources of refugees around the world, and many of them are highly educated uh, individuals. Besides, mismanagement of human resource is one of the main challenges for example, there are many highly educated people placed in positions that are not uh, quite relevant to their uh, educational qualifications. Another challenge is probably, uh, I think Gaim has talked or mentioned this, there is lack of strong linkage between educational sectors and business or public uh, institutions. If there is a strong linkage, it is uh, relevant both for the institutions and for the business or public institutions as they can benefit from each other, but this is not available at this stage. And finally, education in Eritrea is partly being used to implement political agendas and programs. Of course, this is also common in many parts of Africa or other developing country. But in Eritrea, we can see, for example, the closure of the University of Asmara and the militarization of education is an evident example or examples. When we look at the opportunities, uh, for example, despite their uh, limitations, the opening of new higher education institutions in Eritrea is good opportunity. It is good to start from an established institution rather than starting afresh. This also applies to other institutions such as the National Board for Higher Education and the SAWA Vocational uh, Training Center. Of course, I will talk about this. They need to be reformed and replaced. Uh, another uh, opportunity is the inverse of Asmara. 
and its legacy remains among Americans and possibly international partners. Although the investor Asmara is closed, if it can be resumed, there is a great possibility that its quality and standard will be uh, restored within a short period of time. And finally, Eritrea has many uh, committed uh, diaspora communities, including academics and professionals. And many, many of them, they want to help their country with the time and resources that they have if an opportunity comes. Therefore, taking those challenges and opportunities into consideration, I have uh, put with some short-term and long-term uh, recommendations. Those short-term recommendations focus on the assessment, train, training, and motivation of resources. The first one is to assess and strengthen the available human resources to initiate initial change and modernization. I'm purposely putting this initial change and modernization because many of our uh, institutions in Eritrea, including the higher education institutions, are not up to date. Up to date. For example, if even we look at the banking, uh, there is no any modern uh, or up-to-date services. In, for example, there is no any credit card that our students in the business school to, to study with. They just know it by theory. Therefore, we also need to uh, step up ICT like to help the higher education institutions and other business and even public sectors to improve their uh, services. The second point is to upgrade the available capacity or the available staff by offering short-term course, short courses. This could be done in association or in connection with the available colleges and higher education institutions. Another is to train more people at certificate or diploma levels to meet the requirement of various public and private institutions. We have already uh, listened to the presentation that there is a need uh, to create more opportunities, to create more uh, job. Therefore, in order to do this, we need to train our people. Least we can give them a short-term training. Another uh, short-term recommendation is, this could also link to a long-term is, to link organizations to relevant colleges and higher education institutions. As I said earlier, this could benefit uh, both ways. And finally, within the short term, of course, also within the long term, we need to motivate our staff in order to retain them. We need to motivate staff with good salary. We need to motivate staff with other uh, benefits. When we look at the long-term uh, recommendations, those are mainly targeted at restructuring the post-secondary education programs and uh, higher education, including the higher education institutions. Within this, the first thing that I believe should be done is to develop a long and short-term plan with verifiable objectives. This is the thing that higher education institutions in Erita or the higher education sector at a large is missing. Of course, this doesn't mean that it should be started after two years or, or uh, after uh, 18 months. It can be started as early as possible and this should be done with uh, possibly organizing an international conference that can uh, participate everyone, including the diaspora. If you remember, such kind of conference has been done in 1992 to upgrade the investors of Asmara. We also need to establish a new ministry, possibly 
or preferably the Minister of Science and Higher Education to oversee all post-secondary education programs. Now here I'm saying not only the higher education institutions, but all secondary, all post-secondary education institutions should be placed under one bigger institution or organization like the Minister of Science and Higher Education. As uh, probably uh, Guy said, we also need to open the University of Asmara, as I have stated. Its legacy still remains. We also need to gradually upgrade the higher education institutions in Adaiyah, Mainafi, and Karan to university level. One challenge that might be uh, uh, mentioned here is available human and material resources, but they can start even at diploma level and it gradually can be upgraded to degree and higher uh, programs. And uh, in the fourth part, we also need to establish more and structure the available post-secondary technical colleges and create a strong linkage between those colleges and the higher education institutions here. It is significant to create a progression guideline from the post-secondary college or polytechnic college, the diploma and the letter to degree levels. If those colleges and the, the higher education institutions could work together, they can develop a curriculum that could move up to a degree level if they have the right uh, GPA. And finally, we need to open private institutions. Here, I need also to take on board the comment raised by some harm because nowadays private institutions, especially in developing countries, has been a means of income and a, a, a means of uh, producing fake certificates at the cost of money. So this should be taken into consideration and uh, another point is we need also to work on brain circulation. Of course, the, this would go with the socioeconomic and the political development of uh, the nation. I think with the time that I am uh, allowed, I'll finish here. But if you have any questions, comments, I'll be glad to discuss with you. Thank you very much. Okay, I think I'm uh, next. Uh, Tualde Stefanos here. So my topic is going to be um, infrastructure for the rehabilitation of the economy. So hopefully you can see my screen here. So um, as you all know, I mean, infrastructure is huge. There are roads, there are port facilities, there are airports. So I'm going to argue that there is one key critical infrastructure that everything else depends on, and that's the electric, uh, electrical grid. And uh, to illustrate the point, here is Earth by night, and you can see that there is a direct correlation between development and abundance of electricity. Those countries who have it, you can see them by night. The poor countries, not so much. And conversely, you can also argue that lack of electricity uh, is a direct uh, correlation for uh, poverty. So just to focus on the Eritrean situation, we have quite a bit of a challenge to overcome. Um, if we focus on the left side of the screen for a moment, uh, this is energy supply by fuel. So the bulk of the, uh, uh, of the total energy that uh, is produced in Eritrea today is from biomass, meaning from wood and um, animal uh, waste. So almost 80% from uh, biomass, and then 20% or so from uh, oil products, which takes care of the transportation sector, and the little electricity that, that, that we produce from that because the generators run on uh, diesel. So this heavy dependence on biomass, you can imagine the um, negative impact of, uh, it has on the um, environment. So the deforestation rate is 2.4% which is uh, twice the rate of what's considered to be a sustainable threshold. 
And then uh, the arable land, because of the heavy dependence on biomass, um, is only 5% to begin with, and it's shrinking because we're using uh, um, the, the uh, biomass for, uh, for energy. So our arable land is shrinking. And the double whammy is that 80% of our population depends on this shrinking resource. So the picture is not that, uh, that pretty. If you focus on the right side, on the consumption side, uh, almost all the energy that is produced, uh, about 84%, is used by households. And mind you, that's all biomass. So with that, there's hardly anything left for industry. In, fa in fact, industry is only 2%, which is why there's hardly anything, any industry to speak of um, uh, in Eritrea today. So the little electricity that we're, we produce, and it's very unreliable, uh, if you really boil it down to its core, it comes to 70 kilowatt hours per capita, which is really nothing because, because it's just an eight watt bulb. The mean for Africa is uh, 400, so we're way below that. And if you take it to the other extreme for the rich nations in Norway, 23,000 kilowatt hours per capita, and we are at 70. So it's not a surprise that our internet usage and mobile uh, phone usage is as low as it is. Now, uh, all that of this statistic says is that we are stuck at the bottom of this pyramid. This is the Maslow hierarchy uh, of needs. And life in Eritrea today is primarily concerned with the basic essentials, food, water, and the like. We don't even make it to the second rung here, safety and security, because as we all painfully know, Anybody can be sent to a prison or disappeared for any reason at all. So we don't even make it there. So life is stuck at the bottom here. And some of the metrics show this. This is gross national income, one of the lowest in, in the world. In fact, when you map the world by gross national income, the geographic uh, size of uh, Africa shrinks a lot and our averaging is not different. 66% um, of our population lives before the poverty line, and you can imagine how difficult it must be if it was not for the remittances. As uh, Dr. Mabatu alluded to earlier, uh, another human development index metrics, this is a UN metric that essentially measures income, education, and health. And we are at the very bottom on that too, 181 of uh, 187 countries. And I think Dr. McGrath had it at 180 to 189, but you get the, the, the message. So what would be the way forward? As I mentioned earlier, infrastructure is huge, but there is, if we build this key infrastructure correctly, we can, if, if this becomes the foundation for growth, then I think everything else becomes possible. Uh, the first beneficiary of that is information and communication technology, ICT. So when we have abundant electricity 24-7, you have uh, uh, ICT also in a robust form, really broadband internet. Um, and then when you have that, uh, knowledge essentially becomes free because the internet is there, the electricity is there. So you have, you have access to any information you want, you want anytime you want. So knowledge is free. Unfortunately, wisdom is not. That's another story. Uh, so with this uh, knowledge being free, you can import best practices from anywhere in the world that are relevant, that we consider to be relevant to Eritrea. So essentially, when you uh, boil it down to its core, progress, uh, this may be a bit oversimplified, progress is really applied knowledge plus hard work, right? And the applied knowledge has become free. And we have to provide the hard work, of course. So once you get this, then I think smart government and government and public services become possible. Why? Because decision-making processes can improve now. They can be data-driven. Our institutions can be inclusive. They can be self-correcting. And then the rest of the uh, components of the, um, um, the, the rest of the institutions like education, public health, infrastructure, industry, economy, innovation, you name it. All of those can thrive when we have this foundation as strong as uh, it should be, right? 
then your uh, workforce becomes competitive and productive, which eventually leads to better quality of life overall. Now, is it achievable? Yes. Um, the ASAP corridor has a, um, a strong potential for wind energy. Some of the highland areas like the Kalhari also have the same, uh, the same features. Um, solar energy can be built just about anywhere in the mainland in the, in the, in the islands. And with uh, 300 plus uh, islands, we can even dedicate some of, the, of those islands to become um, power generation uh, stations. And then on top of that, we have this unique feature here where the Red Sea is above the Danakil Depression, opening the potential for um, uh, pumped hydroelectricity. So when you combine uh, hydroelectricity with the wind energy, to provide the energy needs during the night, uh, you basically free yourself from uh, having to uh, store energy in batteries because now the Red Sea plus the wind is giving you unlimited battery capacity. So it's definitely achievable. Uh, but how do we get there? Um, I think it's essential that we choose long-term develop par uh, development partners wisely why? Because Eritrea today does not have the skill sets or the capital to do it on its own. Therefore, finding good partners, and I think Scandinavia would be good in my opinion, because they are small and they have all the know-how and the capital that um, will make this possible. And, that, and I think they can be good um, um, part uh, partners in actively tra transferring knowledge. But importantly, I think we, stand, we, we need to start the conversation early. So the plants are more or less ready for launch when the transition that we are all looking forward to becomes a reality. And the advantage of this good partnership is when you have competent partners who own their know-how and the capital, and they're also willing to help you with the um, knowledge transfer, uh, completion times of these projects can be accelerated. And then we have also the, the uh, skill sets to operate it profitably. It has to be for profit, otherwise it's not going to work. I mean, the partners we're looking for have to profit from that. That's the only way to, to make it sustainable. And then we, we can leverage the climate change agenda um, because most of the energy that I, I talked about is going to be green. Uh, to monetize the carbon offsets to, for additional revenues. And if we produce it in abundance, uh, we can attract energy intense, uh, intensive non-polluting industries like uh, server farms, digital mining, uh, digital uh, currency miners, and so on, uh, to basically stabilize the revenue stream uh, for the, from this uh, infrastructure. So the sector itself is a massive employment base, but when you have electricity as reliable as I'm suggesting we should, uh, the other sectors can also uh, be vibrant enough to, to, to be employment bases themselves. So reliable electricity is not just uh, an enabler for economic growth. I would argue that it's also a key enabler for good governance because as I mentioned earlier, data-driven decisions, sharing of best practices can uh, lead to smart governments and public services. So to summarize, if we can have the scalable plans ready and the good partners selected now before uh, the transition, and then when this, uh, the transition uh, rolls in, we start early, and we scale up fast to meet uh, the, the new demands. So if we do that, I think the rest of the infrastructures and institutions can be uh, built on top of that. So let me stop here. Uh, I should mention here before I leave, uh, Abdulis Abun is my co-conspirator in this. I think he's in the audience, so um, maybe we'll bring him uh, on during the question and answer session. Thank you very much. Okay, um, Mabarat, shall I just continue straight away, yeah? Yes, please, David. Okay, hi, 
everybody. I'm David uh, Stein, as um, we said earlier on, I'm based in Birkbeck College uh, here in London. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to make a few points really about um, diaspora and remittances, uh, reconfiguring international economic cooperation, and some policy issues around that. There are three slides just that I don't stray. Kiflam, are you able to put those up? The first Go slide. On. Number four, Mabrahatu. Oh, sorry, number five. I guess I'm number five. Yeah, there's just three slides yeah. there. Yeah, got it. Thank you. Okay, so while Kiflam puts those up, are they coming? There's a slight delay. Um, the step. first addresses some issues around the diaspora and remittances. Uh, that's the second one. Um, Kiflam, can you put it back okay. to the first one? Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess it's a bit of a paradox of a non-Eritrean talking about uh, Eritrean diaspora and remittances, but I just wanted to make some simple points about this. And in fact, on, on all three of um, the slides, I, I guess there's a theme uh, which is not on the slides, but in a way encompasses everything we're discussing, not just today, but um, this week. Um, but in a way, we're talking about change, continuity, and constraints. Um, and I think the issue of the degree to which there's going to be continuity on what I'm talking about, remittances, international economic links, and the degree to which both of those are constrained, both by the actual environment that uh, a changed economic, a uh, changed Eritrea will find itself, but also in terms of the personnel um, of the Eritrean state as it goes through the transition, irrespective of which of the three scenarios that um, Anuratu uh, sketched out earlier on applies. So in terms of remittances, as Anuratu said in the beginning, I mean, it, currently they're somewhere between a third and a half of the whole of Eritrea's GDP. They're going to remain. That's going to be a, a continuum um, that whoever takes over power is going to be reliant upon remittances, both in the short term for household um, income and livelihoods, uh, as a source, as we've already been mentioned, of future uh, economic investment and as the primary source of foreign exchange for the country, as well as um, the base of government's tax revenues. So given all of those factors, both in the short and long term, um, remittance policy of the new authorities and the degree to which they continue the PFDJ's policies is going to be an absolutely critical um, uh, policy decision, both in the very short run, the first of those three phases, um, not six months, but also um, thereafter. And the key issue is, well, is, is the new authority going to continue the 2% tax? Um, and I'll come back to that uh, a little bit later on. Um, more broadly, the diaspora's role in terms of the economy um, can be viewed in all sorts of different ways here. I just list five different points. I mean, there's an immediate set of uh, economic policy issues linking to remittances and monetary policy that the diasporic members, I suspect strongly, along with people who are currently um, in office in Asmara, will need to resolve. Um, there's the key issue that um, several people flagged in the first session uh, about the mix of private and public, um, again, both in the short and medium term. Um, given that the diaspora and the remittances uh, are going to be the main source of um, productive investment, the degree to which um, property law and property rights are respected uh, and the mix between the state and the private sector are going to be absolutely um, crucial. Um, monetary policy is going to be very closely linked to remittances, given they're the source of the overwhelming majority of 
foreign exchange at the moment. And thus, there's a whole series of immediate questions about um, how the value of the NACFA is going to be controlled, if it's going to be allowed to float, et cetera, et cetera. And as we, I think, discussed last um, April in the conference, those issues um, are going to be of immediate importance because in a large matter, in a large, to a large degree, they're going to determine um, the relationship between the new authorities, the population at large, and the diaspora who are providing um, remittances. And um, as Samson said earlier on, there's, there's, a, there's a broader set of issues about transfer of knowledge and technical skills in the economic domain um, that link uh, to diaspora and returnees. Fifthly and finally, in relation to this, I think there's a, there's a broader question um, as to what degree different members of the diaspora actually shape the future Eritrean's foreign investment and trade policy um, in terms of, uh, be it returnees or people overseas, influencing new authorities' attitudes to trade with uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, Middle East, China or the US or whatever. So if we move to the next slide, this then addresses some broader issues of reconfiguring Eritrea's economic international cooperation. Um, so currently, obviously, the um, overseas economic linkages of the country are quite limited. They're heavily personalized. Um, and as such, investment ties, particularly in mining, uh, as well as ad hoc rents from the Gulf states, essentially are the main uh, adjuncts to uh, remittances in terms of um, external interactions of the state's economy with the rest of the region and the world. How might that change and what kind of constraints are likely to be? Well, there is some limited opening at the moment to uh, uh, multilateral organizations, notably the IMF, that I think some people in this group had some interaction with um, last year, as well as uh, UN agencies and organizations. But there's also a very, very convoluted geostrategic um, situation at the moment, um, primarily, I guess, uh, dominated by two factors. Firstly, the entry of China um, into the region, and particularly as a major investor in Ethiopia and the Ethiopian infrastructure in particular, as well as Djibouti's port. Um, but then also um, the manner in which different powers in the Middle East, partly in competition with each other, um, have had an impact upon the Red Sea area. So the new authorities in Eritrea are going to have to navigate and negotiate with um, Gulf countries as well as Turkey, etc. So in addition to those factors, the other obvious major question in terms of reconfiguring international cooperation is the relationship with Ethiopia. It's going to be one of the main topics uh, in tomorrow's foreign affairs session. Um, but I guess, to my mind, there are two factors. One, the degree to which the partial opening uh, over the past year um, between Asmara and Avis and Magali, um, will be resurrected, given that it's been reversed. I mean, does the arrangement uh, between Abi and uh, Isaias provide some kind of uh, blueprint for what might happen post Isaias? Um, but far more importantly, I think, is the degree to which many Eritreans, I know not all, some, some people in this group have been to Addis and elsewhere in recent years, but uh, I think many Eritreans outside of Eritrea just uh, don't realize the extent to which Ethiopia's economy has changed, not only grown, um, but also become far more sophisticated and has developed so much infrastructure. And I think the degree to which um, Eritrea uh, needs to address and adapt to a far, far more advanced um, and a far richer uh, Ethiopia, um, which is far more self-confident both regionally and internationally uh, is something of great importance to Eritrea in the future. Um, so if we just look at the final slide, I kind of encapsulated three points. 
uh, which I guess are policy debates or policy issues, um, uh, which I've already alluded to. I mean, the first one, what kind of remittance policy would a new authority adopt? Would they retain um, a 2% uh, or maybe even higher uh, uh, call upon the diaspora? Um, if so, what kind of policy implications would that have in terms of external interactions with the diaspora? Uh, what policy should be adopted vis-a-vis -vis the NACFA? I think those questions are far, far more important than uh, ties with donors, uh, both multilateral and bilateral. Yes, there will be some support um, from UN, uh, IMF and World Bank agencies, but I think the interaction with Eritreans overseas uh, who have been in the past and will continue to be uh, the major contributors to Eritrea's economy are more important. Secondly, in, in relation to uh, economic ties with Ethiopia, do those have to be fundamentally reconfigured or does the existing, albeit not applied, agreement uh, provide a blueprint for relations in the future? As I said, I'm sure that will be discussed more tomorrow. And then finally, there are a series of questions about um, what kind of interactions Eritrea will have not just with Ethiopia and Sudan, but with um, Middle Eastern powers, most particularly Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, who obviously have a contract uh, to use Assad at the moment, which then leads to the broader question, already alluded to a little bit earlier on, um, of ports and infrastructure in Eritrea and the degree to which a uh, future Eritrean government sees itself uh, adopting um, and national based policies, if you like, to build up Eritrean infrastructure, or the degree to which they're going to, by necessity, have to integrate with pre existing infrastructure, um, most particularly in Ethiopia, much, although not all of it, financed by China. So I'll stop there. Thank you, David. Okay, so the Presentation covers uh, what sustainable development means in terms of mining uh, in Eritrea and then the uh, challenges and the opportunities. Can you go back, uh, go to the next slide, please? So, uh, in poor countries like Eritrea, um, the importance of uh, mining could not be downplayed. It has uh, importance in of uh, in uh, injecting money as a source of foreign and domestic investment. It contributes to GDP through mineral export and then employment of local uh, people and uh, uh, wages and then also transfer of uh, 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 knowledge and skills through training, uh, training and skills development. Next slide, please. Uh, but mining uh, has also a lot of uh, trade offers. It's um, operators across, mainly across three areas, uh, three important areas. That's the economic, social, and environmental. Uh, so you have uh, to have a good equilibrium or a good balance. Although economic pro profitability is important, then it should not be at the expense of the socioeconomics of the communities. At the, at the same time, it should not be uh, at the uh, expense of the environment. So a sustainable mining resource would include profitable uh, system or economic profitability, but also includes uh, uh, benefits of local uh, communities in terms of socioeconomic advancement. In addition, it should not uh, impact the environment uh, negatively. Uh, we also need to underline that mining are a uh, resource not only for us, but also they belong to the future uh, generations. So the investment of mining should bear uh, in mind in mind that uh, 
uh, future generations should benefit from, uh, from it. And that could be done in terms of uh, investment into human capital, institutional uh, capital, good governance in institutions because they have implications for the uh, uh, next generation. Next, please. Uh, so the left, uh, on this slide, uh, on the left side, we have the economic uh, profitability and uh, Eritrea uh, is endowed with a lot of uh, uh, mining uh, resource that could be uh, precious metals or construction materials and so on. Uh, and uh, probably the only benefit that we have seen from the last 29 post-independence years, uh, uh, years is that this resource have been unlocked. Uh, before um, a few years, uh, until probably 2018, the main actor or local actor in the mining sector was the artisanal mining sector. And um, uh, local communities Eritrea, in Eritrea were harvesting around 500 kilo kilograms of gold a year. At the moment, that artisanal sector is completely decimated and it has become part of the covert economy or is absolutely controlled by the military. Uh, and that's the part that remains from the control of the Enamco. Uh, Enamco is the Eritrean Ma national mining uh, company, which is un run under the PFTJ. Although Enamco officially the property of the Minister of Finance, the Minister of Finance has no control on it. It's headed by the head of economic uh, affairs of PFTJ, Mr. Hagos Gebrehiwat, and uh, who also uh, wears another hat as the head of uh, economy department of the Minister of uh, Finance. So Enamco is under absolute control of the party and uh, it's the, mine, uh, the main actor now in Eritrea's uh, mining resources. And uh, it operates mostly in collaboration with uh, foreign uh, mining companies and there is no, or there is only little involvement of uh, local people in its uh, uh, activities. So the estimated income from the mining sector for Eritrea is around 1 billion EST a year. Uh, of course, this uh, fluctuates uh, from year to year, but at least from 2018 onward, this Eritrea is expected to gain around 1 billion US dollars a year from mining. Uh, uh, this started from the Bisha mining earlier. Now we have exploitation in the mining uh, areas in Zara, around Asmara, and the uh, uh, Kololi Potash uh, mining will uh, start uh, very soon. So in terms of social uh, responsibility, uh, the report shows that there is fundamental uh, violation of human rights uh, uh, from the mining companies and also they are collaborators within Eritrea, that's Enamco, and also the local companies that are involved in transportation and construction. There is uh, unethical uh, business practices. There is poor employee health and safety performance. There is no sustainability report and independent verification. There is disregard to community development and stakeholder engagement. There is also disregard for artisanal mining and uh, monopolization, as I said. The sector is completely monopolized by, by the party or by Enamco. And then in terms of environmental sustainability, there is absence of environmental laws. Although there are minor laws, they don't uphold or they don't respect the existing environmental laws in Eritrea. So decisions are made at the whim of 
of uh, uh, the local authorities or, or the party authorities, respective of uh, mining laws or environmental laws. Uh, Michael says there is a twisted mining approval system. Uh, that's saying there is no transparency in the approval system is uh, uh, done in a hidden way by the party authorities and their foreign uh, collaborators. There is poor environmental protection policies and practices. There is disregard to biodiversity and land use. There is ineffective product design, use, reuse, recycling, and disposal practices. There is ineffective risk assessment and management practices. Next slide, please. So an assessment was uh, made uh, based on ecological sustainability and uh, human sustainability uh, factors. Uh, this diamond looking uh, picture shows inefficiency, economy, environment, community, safety, all the factors are combined together to provide these indices. From the uh, picture on the right side of the screen, you have, for example, ecological sustainability on the x-axis and human sustainability, sustainability on the y-axis. One is low sustainability and six is very high sustainability. So assessment of the mining sector in Eritrea shows that it's unsustainable. It falls on the top left corner, uh, which is a score of little above one in terms of ecological sustainability and score of about two in terms of uh, human or socioeconomic sustainability. So all in all, the mining sector in Eritrea uh, is not sustainable. So that's the point we spotted earlier. The, uh, sorry, next slide, please. So the point that we spotted earlier indicated by now. So what do we have to do to make it sustainable for, for the future? At the moment, there is no ecological sustainability or there is low human sustainability. So how do we improve it? Next slide, please. Uh, so there are two recommendations. The first one covers the economic profitability and the second component covers the human and uh, environmental sustainability. In terms of economic profitability, uh, Michael says the Eritrea's investment laws and regulations need uh, to be uh, reviewed. At the moment in most uh, mining sectors, the Eritrean government gets from 40 to 50% uh, of the revenues, uh, but there is no, uh, this is uh, just a crude income. The country is not involved in, in value addition. What's exported is a crude extract, and then the gold or whatever resource is processed outside the country. So the country loses much in terms of value addition. So uh, the Eritrea investment laws should be revised. And then uh, Michael says there should be a, a local and international uh, stakeholder investment should be encouraged. Uh, as we know, there is no uh, transparency in the mining sector, so we don't know where the money goes. Uh, we know from uh, Bisha Mining, for example, the government gained around 1.2 billion uh, US dollars, but what, we don't know where this money uh, went or ended up. So there is uh, a need to investigate uh, uh, where these revenues are going, but also uh, Michael thinks there is corruption in the uh, mining sector itself. So there should be some investigation uh, 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 held. Then there should be 
enhancement of exploitation and mining license following appropriate exploration and mining approval systems. And this is to ensure uh, transparency and uh, accountability. I think I'll continue. Uh, uh, I don't see the slide there, but uh, I'll continue. So in terms of social and environmental uh, sustainability, the recommendations are there should be implementation uh, and validation of risk assessment and management practices of the mining uh, sector. Implement strict employee health and safety laws and regulations. Foster stakeholder and community engagement. Investigate the gross human rights violation and compensation compensate the affected members of communities or stakeholders, then review the Eritrea's constitution, especially land rights. Uh, if you look at the 1994 uh, land proclamation and also the Eritrean constitution itself, land belongs to, to the government. And that makes automatically stakeholders or local communities uh, uh, outside the equation, they have no chance to gain any benefit from the resources. The laws um, uh, provide uh, some areas for compensation. If somebody is, uh, for example, uh, dislocated from a location because of mining or uh, industrial activities, then they are allowed to be compensated by uh, by uh, pro providing them uh, with uh, new land lists or something like that, but there will be no financial compensation. Uh, in addition, because local communities do not own the resource themselves, they have no chance of benefiting from uh, revenues of the resources. So it will be dependent on the government whether uh, 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 communities benefit from the resources or not. Uh, we have seen this in Bisha, we have seen this around Asmara, and I'm sure it's going to happen around Kololi with the potash uh, mining resources. Local communities have no say in terms of planning, in terms of participation, but also they have no uh, uh, say in the revenues that are uh, obtained from the resources. Then the next uh, recommendation is introduce social licenses system to operate. That's to ensure uh, socioeconomic sustainability of local communities. Introduce comprehensive social and environmental approval systems. Enhance local capacities through training in governance and skills development. As we know, mining has very limited uh, forward and backward linkages, so and uh, it's very prone to exploitation by a predator system. So, uh, training of local communities and their proper involve in involvement in the sector will allow them to be involved uh, in a better way. At the moment, the relationship is between the government and the uh, international mining companies, and there is no uh, trickle down of, of revenues towards uh, local communities. Uh, and also those uh, community members that are employed in these mining companies are uh, hold positions, very low positions, like uh, they are involved maybe as cleaners or dinner ladies or something like that they are not involved as technicians or higher, uh, highly paid uh, employees. So the improvement of their local capacity through training and governance will uh, allow them to get involved more into, in the activities. I think that's it. Uh, thank you very much. I don't think we have uh, much time left. It is almost... Uh... 40 minutes to six, but I will give just, uh, if uh, you, you Fisu, would you like to say something? You? Yes. 
Yeah, sure. Uh, to, first of all, I would like to congratulate for the organizers and for the interesting presentations. <clears throat> uh, well, my comments were mostly with the previous session, but maybe I can send them in writing to the organizers. And the, for the second session, in the capacity building section, I seem, I think we seem to have missing the national development uh, data strategy. Like we, for example, GDP was today quoted to be 6.5 billion, but if we go to IMF, it's 2.6 because quite frankly, I don't know how we do it. So we need a very strong national data uh, development strategy, meaning strengthening the uh, National Statistics Office. I believe that's critical. A part of should be the capacity building strategy because uh, to make uh, to, to, to make policy driven uh, evidence driven policy you need to know where you are and then we can also uh, assess where we're going so I, I think I think uh, we need some something uh, along the uh, as part of the institutional development I would include uh, national data uh, development strategy in all sectors which we can eventually go to more of an open data uh, strategy. So, you know, which could be also used as a, as a, as a transparency tool and the monitoring the, 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 the government's activity and would be also useful for private investors, et cetera, et cetera. So I just want to restrict my comment because we don't have a lot of time to that. And I'll send, I have other comments in regards to the reintegration, like, because all we seem to be talking about reintegrating people from unemployment or from out of the labor force to the labor force. And I believe we need to have a coherent, active and passive labor market programming policies in place, uh, be it during the transition or even in the long term, because uh, a job creation should be always the objective, not just for transition, but throughout. So yeah, I don't know if I have uh, much time, but... Uh, you. Uh, Kiflom, do you have do you have time? Can we take some time because it is time now for the summary. So would you allow me some time? We take some. Yeah, we finish around six thirty. Uh, okay, okay. So we can have. Uh, okay. We have okay. a little bit of time. Yeah, yeah. For the uh, question and answers. Yeah. Okay, okay. So uh, I go to the one who hasn't spoken, Ibrahim or Francis. Ibrahim. So if I may finish, can I finish, please? Yes, yes, please. Can I finish, Mike? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, so for me, I think we need uh, uh, we need to look at the role of the economic role of the government. Uh, uh, most presenters have been talking about the economic role of the government, and we don't seem to be very clear on that. And we need. I, I would suggest having a working group and mapping out that exactly. What do we mean? How do we, we think government should be involved? What should be its role during the transition and after? Because uh, if without clarifying that, then I think it's gonna, there's going to be a problem with how we, we do things. Because uh, I think poverty is our number one enemy, but we want also the government to be part of the, the, the solution, not the problem. Uh, some are suggesting, for example, dismantling the, 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 the system as it exists. But then, do we mean no government role at all, or what? What should we? Do? So I think we need we need a very uh, good paper. I would suggest on what exactly should be the role of the government during the transition and after, in terms of its economic contribution. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ibrahim, Francis. Please, everybody, please be precise as much as possible and limit to one comment or uh, question. We have uh, several people who have raised their hands. Ibrahim, the floor is yours. Well, okay, thank you, Doctor. Uh, uh, in the first uh, topic, I have uh, one question on and the second one also one. In the first one, because uh, we know Eritrea and uh, there is a poor infrastructure and also a poor social service in all. Um, in all over uh, the country, but there are a very, very, very affected areas in several um, parts of the country, especially in the Priberi. So uh, it's good ideas that uh, all we hear from the presenters, but 
uh, I think this is a huge in the uh, in the in the sphere of the use of the transitional area. That's the tra trans transitional period of uh, three years. And uh, my first question is how we can. Uh, consolidate all the efforts to bring and to give access to all the people of the land or to all the people of Eritrea because there is a, a huge difference between the highland Eritrea because we cannot avoid the, the reality. So how we can uh, consolidate all the efforts to join the people into the uh, economic uh, empowerment and also uh, to reduce the poverty because we don't want people to be a corridor for the development because we should have to focus on all the people, at least giving an access to all the people. So how we can give that uh, in the spare of these three years? And this, I think, is uh, my first question. <clears throat> and the second question about the mining or mining um, or mining topic, I think uh, the challenges are there and the recommendations are there. But the most uh, things is that the land issue is not a contest or it's not problematic. There is a part of the land uh, issue because our people, uh, indigenous and the, the people that knows the land, knows everything, every stone and every tree, and every, they know their borders and there is no context because the people have been there for thousands of years and they know what belongs to them. But the contest part is <clears throat> in the western lowlands and some areas of, in Samhar and the Kala regions that there may be some people uh, who, were not be, who were not there before, but who came and who settled there. And these are Eritreans and there's no problem, but there should be a way. But the second issue that's the, the, the land that is taken by the government should have to be returned to the people. That's the issue should have to be because the government or the land that was associated with the people of Eritrea who come from another area and settled it there, there's no problem. And there can be a commission of uh, the land reform that can also <coughs> commission it uh, to settle the problems, including the community and also professionals. But the issue with the government land, because we know in Aligadir, in Sawa, <coughs> in Fort Sawa, in all, all these areas. So, okay, okay, give me one minute because of this is the issue. Uh, I should have to uh, uh, give a focus because, so we should have to uh, uh, consider that because the issue of the, the land that's taken by the government, there is no need for the contest because it should have to be returned to the people. In the mining areas, I have uh, one question to... No, I think I think I'm sorry here. Uh, that's, that's, yeah, that's, I will bring it to one. I will bring it to one because it's... Here, also. How it can retain the benefits? How it can retain the benefits? Because the, the land of the Bisha and the, this, uh, what you call Kulili Potash projects are now taking a million of dollars from the, from the land of the people. So how we can return the money that have been gone by the government and they return the money to the people to empower the local communities? How we can do that? Because we can Thank think you. for the future, Thank but you. we cannot forget the, the, uh, the history. Okay. Ibrahim gives us an, uh, a viewpoint from the Afar region, so that was uh, quite uh, useful. Uh, next, Harimna, please be precise. <coughs> I, will, I will be very fast. Well, I have so much to say, I'm very excited. But since Dr. <laughs> Mohammed is pushing us, I'll come to the point. So um, my question with context goes towards uh, Tom de Stefanos. Uh, first of all, maybe to everyone, uh, I think we were saying, you know, e economy is vital for peaceful and successful transition. And then we said economy, economic recovery should come later. I truly believe that what we need is a policy framework. That's something I've been missing here today. So there needs to be a clear economic framework where everything that has been presented today will find place and vision and direction. And um, I believe that Tuarla Stefanos and Adulis Abun touched on it with the green economy. Um, I think that the green economy could be an excellent uh, overall umbrella, like a framework under which policies are created and all the other aspects would be coming under that. So I can see three um, real benefits to creating uh, developing Eritrea into a leading green economy 
on the continent of Africa and even the world. Number one, it will give us an economic framework. It will create jobs because, you know, under that, um, the manufacturing, the skill education that has been men mentioned, the higher education, the technology, the development of technology, all of that could be um, uh, directed towards a green economy. Then also the attraction of foreign direct investment. There's actually something called green foreign direct investment. And we could, instead of competing with the foreign direct investment with many other nations, especially in Africa, we could position ourselves as, as, a, as a continent, sorry, as a nation that wants to go towards green uh, development and therefore, we could be attracting different kind of foreign direct investment and green foreign direct, uh, direct investment. Um, number two, also, it would allow for inclusive grow growth. Ibrahim has just mentioned that, and some of you as well, the concern that, you know, some big co cooperations or foreign companies will take over. But if we have a green uh, development framework, and that is the national vision that is an umbrella to everything else that's happening, then inclusive growth also comes much more natural to that, where the, um, you know, the, uh, the communities from Afar region to Gashbarka um, that are heavily depending also on the environment and the mm -hmm. natural resources will be involved in uh, the creation of jobs. And number three is... Number three, I haven't even asked the question. <laughs> I think you should give, give more time, okay, but generally, I mean. Um, so positioning is also important since we are competing with everyone. So Eritrea is 20 to 30 years behind. Now, the problem is, if we are talking about development, just like everyone else in Africa, we will always stay 20 to 30 years behind. And that means we have to do something differently in order to catch up. And you call it positioning yourself smartly in the marketplace where you take on a different route. And we have a, a, um, an advantage here in Eritrea because guess what? Everyone else is talking about climate change and the manufacturers, uh, manufacturing sector, the industries, the economies need to be adjusted. That means to be, that means, I'm feeling rushed, that's why I'm falling over, over my own words. Um, that means that, um, you know, everything needs to be undone that was done in a traditional way. Now, Eritrea is starting from scratch, and that can work in our own advantage. If we are starting straight away towards the new global direction of climate change and green economy, we can actually start that from scratch without needing to reinvent traditional uh, um, uh, industries. We can start that from scratch and everything would come under that. So I'm gonna stop here. I'm so glad to what the Stefanos mentioned the green economy. I believe that is the way forward for Eritrea, and I would love to um, for every everything to come under that. I have so you. much more. I have so much more to say. Go ahead. This <laughs> time we give you another chance. To say, Doctor, to say, and this is. Thank you, thank you, Doctor Mohammed, and thank you for the speakers again. Uh, I'm a, a second one online then with uh, uh, Dr. Harnath as well to be very happy to talk about sustainable energy. This is the area where I really, my daily bread comes from. So thank you to all for that, uh, for that great uh, energy topic. Um, I think the, the issue I have there is about the manpower, the capacity that we have. Um, this is the concerns I have, whether, to, uh, but renewable energy is a feature that I see in Eritrea, that we don't have to follow the rest of the world, the path that, the failed path we don't have to follow. So this is a, a great, but for me, what I want to hear from Torda is, I, I am interested in this conference. Of course, the long term is very good, we call it green, we call it blue, we call it sustainable, it doesn't matter. 
For me, I, I want us here to talk the immediate need for us now, okay? In Eritrea now, 10% of the society does not have electricity, okay? If we, if ISAS goes tomorrow, what do we do? How do we bring this energy now? How do we, how do we create these jobs to come, okay? I, I wish to hear from, from Tolde if there is any research, okay? What, what we could do immediately if the, if the transition government comes, okay? Uh, for the long term, of course, we have to invest, but how do we give energy to Eritrea people? <coughs> how, do, how do all the things can work in, in uh, energy-wise, uh, okay? How could, for example, the investment happen? Because if that is not available, nothing can happen. It will take us for wind energy, for solar power energy, for uh, hydropower energy, it will take us some years in the future. I want to uh, uh, thank you very much. And I will give one more to Fitui and then I'll give it to the presenters to comment. Fitui, floor is yours. Unmute, unmute, unmute. Unmute, please. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try to talk uh, as fast as I can to save time. But I will, I'll start with a, uh, with a comment. Uh, I think there is a lot to be said here, uh, especially when it comes, uh, and I am an urban, an urban planner as well as an economist. And on the economic part, we could enrich the topics that we raised in a much deeper and policy-wise relevant uh, 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 way. If we get the documents that you worked on and we uh, put groups in order to, to, to work and enrich those ideas. To go to my question, I identified two foundational uh, issues. One of them wasn't addressed very much. And the second one relates to infrastructure. Foundational because infrastructure is the basis upon which we can build uh, the future of the country and also because it is the greatest uh, contributor uh, for immediate employment during the transitional period. Uh, and the second one is, the other one is, relates uh, to mobilization of the uh, scripted uh, uh, brothers and sisters. And immediately after the transition uh, or after the demise of the current government, what is going to happen is it's going to create uh, an environment of resentment by the people who are left away, uh, behind because these are people who have been storing the, stolen their uh, uh, youth and their future. There has, and we need them for, uh, in order to create or, uh, or sustain a rule of law and uh, upon which we can build the uh, uh, foundation of democracy. There has to be a way by which we can create their confidence and uh, uh, reduce resentment uh, in the transition period. And the second one is, uh, and the other one that I, I would like to ask, this the, re the, the main question of my, uh, uh, of my address. To, given that the infra infrastructure is an area where we expect the largest source of employment to come, in the transition period, and that it is a sector where we are going to base our uh, investments for the future. Shouldn't we have a, a specific uh, group that addresses the possibilities and the opportunities uh, uh, for uh, infrastructure investment during the transition period? Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Fatoui. Uh, I'll give the floor now to Told. I think most, uh, some most of the comments were uh, on his uh, presentation, and then the other presenters can comment on the issues raised by the those who... Well, I, I, I hope I'm not going to disappoint people because the expectation is so high. Um, I think, Dr. Hannett, you were talking about the green economy, and I absolutely agree. Uh, that is one thing that we need to focus on. Uh, let, let me first say, I'm not an economist. I'm just a technologist and not a very good one at that. So. Uh, this is just a, a thought experiment, really, because if you look at our potential and not even using, you know, 1% um, uh, uh, of it, it's very, very disappointing. It's there. Now, 
Because of the problems that we've had with um, uh, uh, keeping talent, uh, you know, talent is something that we have been bleeding over the last 20 years. So the skill sets are, you know, basically depleted out of Eritrea. That's why I'm focusing on good partners now who have the capital and the know-how and we, we, who can come on board to, to do an active knowledge transfer so we can build this up. I think this has a huge potential, like you said, Dr. Hannett, not just for, for Eritrea, but globally. Eritrea can be one of the biggest green energy producers you know, in the world. And I think that can, uh, not only is it enough for, for Eritrea, it can be, you know, it can even expand to the neighboring countries. So the, the potential is there. Unfortunately, it's just a thought experiment at this, at this point. We need to build the relationships the main reason I was focusing on Scandinavia was there are a lot of Eritreans there. So maybe the relationship can start building now. And then we can take a look at this and really develop it into a plan before the transition rolls in. Um, I think, uh, Dr. Fusai, uh, is there uh, research that was done? I don't think there, there is. There was one PhD program that, uh, uh, I mean, uh, thesis that I saw a while back. Uh, and, but there is not really that much. In ASAB, I think there were three um, windmills that were installed a while ago for a measly, I don't know, 300 kilowatt uh, capacity. And they are not even operating. So the, the talent that has bleeding out of Eritrea is the main problem. So we need to kind of give hope uh, to, to, to the new population to say there is a potential if we can get our act together. So uh, Abdulis, if, are you, if you're in line, please add in to, uh, to, to this. But that's, I think, uh, what I have for now. Okay. Uh, can you say a little bit on the issues on mining and uh land and uh, people who live in those areas? You're muted, unmute, please. Unmute, unmute, Magrat. Yeah, yeah, I'm on now. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first, I, was, I think I'll start, I'll add something to what Tolda said on Dr. Harness. I think uh, green economy is a um, potential, a good way for Eritrea, but is for long-term investment. Like uh, uh, Dr. Fusahaye said, what we need now is uh, uh, the issues about getting uh, immediate electricity, water, food, and so on. And for that, I think Eritrea doesn't have the resources for green economy. We are not uh, at the stage where we can invest a lot on uh, manufacturing or service at the moment. So that's for long-term. The immediate priority would be to enhance whatever source of electricity we have. It could be uh, 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 pro uh, improving the generators in Hergigo or whatever uh, other generators have uh, in the country just for the immediate future. But in the long term, it could be a um, uh, green economy. Uh, I also agree with Dr. Futui that um, uh, critical uh, infrastructure is very foundational that it promotes employment. We didn't mention it, but in the report it's indicated that it's very important for cre job creation, but also in addition to that construction uh, with proper uh, uh, investment policies and monetary policies of the government diaspora Eritreans can invest into in, in housing and so on, which is one of the main uh, employers in, a, in the developing countries. Uh, to go back to um, Ahmed, my, I think you're uh, right, uh, local communities should benefit from the resource they, they, uh, in their surroundings but also um, there are different ways where they can benefit. First of all, I worked a lot uh, in this area in terms of uh, coastal uh, development or protected areas and uh, biodiversity, uh, the biodiversity conservation. 
And one of the things that could be done is for local communities to be partners in the investment because they own the land or the resources, but they don't have the money, they don't have the knowledge and the capital to invest themselves. So usually what happens is you'd have like a tripartite partnership, government, local communities, and then private investors investing into the sector and then local communities would be direct beneficiaries from, from the resources. Uh, but also it has to do with a rule of law like we discussed uh, uh, yesterday and uh, proper, uh, properly functioning government would give confidence to the companies but also to the local communities that uh, they would know that their resources are not being ransacked. I think that's what uh, I would like to say. Uh, can, can, I, can, I, can I add just a little bit to that, uh, Dr. Mohammed? Sorry. Okay. Um, I think my argument was the green energy can start immediately, not just long term. What we have today is nothing, really. It's an old infrastructure that is bleeding the energy that's being produced. I think the line loss is something like 23%. So the reason why I was saying scalable you know, plan was to start small, even with green energy, because what we have is really nothing. So building that up is not going to be worthwhile. I think we need to start small and scale it up as fast as we can, but green energy, it can, we can get started right away from the beginning. Thank you. Uh, Samson, do you have anything to add? Would you like to add? Yeah, actually, I just want to raise one thing that Ibrahim raised. I want to add to what Ibrahim raised. He, I think, mentioned access to everyone, especially to those disadvantaged uh, societies or groups. Uh, that's important point, and there are three ways that we can increase access, especially widen participation to those uh, disadvantaged group. One is we need to give more institutions, more higher education institutions. The second is, of course, there is an affirmative action, and this has been used for women in Eritrea. But to be honest, I'm not a fan of affirmative action because its own it has its own side effects, and it wouldn't work for long. Because if you are admitted based on affirmative action, on there is a psychological uh, effect. There is also a quality effect because you will be placed to the lowest. Uh, departments or to the departments that are neglected by many. So the main uh, solution is build more schools to those disadvantaged, with a focus to those disadvantaged areas. And uh, as a last or a third option is, I mentioned it in my presentation, link colleges to higher education institutions. If those of, if students from law, from colleges can be admitted to higher education, especially those with a better grades. I think this also could increase from those disadvantaged areas who had less uh, GPAs than the entry to higher education institutions. Thank, Thank you very much. Be, Thank you yeah. very much. Now I give to the next group. Uh, I'll start with uh, Professor Ala. The floor. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed. Well, uh, what we are talking now really about economic development, uh, though I really, given the short time that you are giving me, let me express my appreciation to all the presenters, but my focus is on uh, Tolde Stefanos' presentation, which is the infrastructure dealing with energy. As we all know, for basics for economic development are infrastructure. When we talk about infrastructure, we are talking about road networks, about airports, about seaports, etc. But energy to me is central because if we are talking about manufacturing and all the other things, you know, they depend on energy. And uh, what Tolde uh, Stefanos has mentioned about the green economy uh, generating energy. Uh, I just want to ask him, you know, what, how much capital does it require? You know? How much of investment would it require to provide green energy based, you know, green, uh, green energy based uh, energy, essentially green 
base economy energy uh, to provide as a basis for economic development in Eritrea. Thank you very much, Professor Arad. I give now the floor to Barakat Araya, who has not uh, got a chance. I will jump the group. Barakat. Thank you. Uh, I would first uh, like to thank you um, for the opportunity to participate here. I would like to thank the and con congratulate the organizers and the presenters. That was great. Um, I just want to make a comment and not really a question because in this limited time, we cannot really cover the all the issues that we are raising, it's great that we are discussing them. Um, for me, when we talk about economic policies and how we should be going after, hopefully in a short while, when we have the opportunity to uh, make decisions and uh, uh, policies for, of our own, because we don't have that opportunity at the time, it is mainly the process uh, by which we develop the policies and the process by which we change them, economic policies, will be very important because um, confidence is key for investors, uh, for people, um, small investors, big in investors alike. Uh, it is the confidence that will be playing key part in economic development, particularly after the scars that we have gone through. So many people have gone uh, to make contribution to Eritrea after independence, and they have lost not only their investments, but many, even their lives. So um, going forward, it is how do we build confidence to investors, to the people, to even the refugees to go back home and to try to do their best for their own, for their country. So at least uh, we, we really need to kind of, uh, Eob has mentioned very important thing. Where are we now? What does the airtime economy look like? And how do we uh, go for the future? What do we even know? Not much. So it is the institutions that we need to develop. Um, uh, we need a very uh, independent, very empowered by law statistical agency uh, that will give us, you know, what the national economy looks like now, but also at every step uh, in the process. So that's what I really want to make. Uh, it, is, it may not be necessarily a specific economic issue that, but, we are talking about policies now. We're not going to keep on changing them, but we will because it will be required. But if we change them, what will be the process of compensating of those investors who, who will be losing um, because of our changing in policies? So those kind of uh, assurances and proper kind of government and governance that will go a long way to. Uh, giving us a good start in the economy. Thank you, thank you, Barakat. Sorry, can I just intervene one sec? May we give a, a chance to Dr. Gabriel? I think he's fixed his uh, microphone now. Uh, okay, okay, very much good. Thank you very much. I hope it's working now. Yes, so I've, yeah, I've shared my comments you now so through text and uh, a linkage, so you will find there. But I think, since we don't have time, well, these kind of issues cannot be discussed in this short you know, time, but at least, you know, it might give us um, uh, an idea what we need to do. But I would like all of us to consider the current um, the condition of the country. Um, if we are going to talk about economic development and um, in the transition period, what we are going to inherit is a depopulated country. Eritrea is being depopulated. Every village, if you, if you ask your you know, uh, friends and their relatives, the villages are in, being emptied every day. So that's what we'll get. So if this critical element 
is missing. So anything that we might think uh, that we can do will not have any impact without the, 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 the population, the human um, aspect of development and, and, and so on. So let's think out of the box, no? We have to imagine. So just create in your mind, you know, a country, empathy, and, and, and what, what can be done. So I would like um, uh, 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 um, all of us to, to, to reimagine you know, a country because this, this, this is very unique to Eritrea. And you cannot learn it from our textbooks and from other experience, actually. So it's a unique situation, and we have to um, bother our, ourselves in reimagining Eritrea after the transition. And this all depends on what kind of transition, what kind of you know, struggle that we have now to undertake in order to dislodge the government and, you know, uh, 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 and in fact, a transition period. It, it all depends on that. So let's concentrate our energy on that now. And all these great ideas, we'll have the time and then we will imagine uh, our, our country. So when I see this one, our problem is institutional. And that means we have to build institutions in order to take Eritrea to the next step. But it's, uh, it is going to be a great challenge. So it is time sensitive. We don't have time now. So let's concentrate on our energies to the struggle to dislodge this government or, or, or dictator or what you can, you can name it. So let's, let's concentrate on that. Then you will have time for all this. That's what I want to uh, Thank you say. Very much. Yeah. Uh, Thank you very much. Yep. Okay, uh, I have to go back to Hapte and Kiflom. We have time because we have only 15 minutes left. If we are to close at 6.30, uh, um, can we take some few more minutes? Um, uh, Helen? Sorry, Helen. I was just going to say, Fukra and Sabine have had their hands up for a long time. So I think it's fair that we give them a chance to ask. Um, Okay, if you have the same, same uh, here, by the I think, way. I think, um, sorry, Helen, the uh, KM3 has been raising his son for a long time. KM3, I don't know, K yeah, KM3. Thank you. He's been raising the, his son for a long time. I'm sorry. Go ahead, I think. Yeah, uh, but, uh, yes, uh, yes uh, Dr. Kidane? Uh, He's been lo waiting yeah. for a long time. Yeah. Am I on? Okay. Uh, yes. In my mind, uh, Eritrea's economic uh, problems or challenges, uh, I see them in two, uh, two types. One is a structural, and the other one is policy, wrong-headed policies. The structurals, I think, we pointed out uh, things like the uh, open-ended uh, national service, we talked about uh, absence of land markets in urban areas that has created housing prices. Uh, we talked about, uh, to some extent, uh, the license, uh, credit, and foreign exchange access to the private sector. Uh, all these uh, structural problems uh, block any economic development. And so the transitional period would have to address these structural problems very quickly. And then we can also talk about the uh, policy problems, uh, like land policy in general. Uh, the infrastructure issue that uh, Tolda presented in, in a very uh, excellent way. Uh, we have the educational policy problem. Uh, we have the uh, re uh, economic relations with the Ethiopia problem, all these things. Uh, what I want to say about this is conferences such as this are very useful. However, I think we would be more productive if we organize teams that would deal with these structural and policy problems in greater detail. Because right now we are uh, basically uh, presenting papers that the most part are very general. And they're not going to be very useful. But if we organize research teams that would discuss each of these issues in greater detail and, uh, uh, and, and uh, 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 prepare papers, for instance, 
we would be doing a great service to the transitional government because these papers could be uh, resources for the uh, for the transitional government. So I encourage uh, the organizers, the organized research teams, so that we deal with the problems uh, systematically and we provide uh, papers to the transitional government. Uh, and, and I think we can make ourselves useful that way rather than just conference papers that are very general. Thank, Thank you. you very much, uh, Dr. Kidane. Next, I give it to Fred. 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 So thank you for, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, oh, thank you for the organizers and thank you for uh, having me here. Uh, just to uh, share this, the uh, concern from uh, Dr. Gabriel as well, uh, the issue of um, depopulation. Uh, being myself, you know, like recently uh, worked in Eritrea, especially on uh, emergency programs, I have seen myself uh, village, you know, uh, getting like emptied and, uh, uh, you know, like uh, families are really uh, uh, living in villages and the villages are uh, becoming empty uh, increasingly. So uh, I would say uh, a part of the transition is really to um, undertake a robust uh, rehabilitation and reintegration process. Uh, if we really uh, manage this and coordinate well, I'm very sure there are um, stakeholders who are uh, interested and have influence in supporting the process. Uh, like for example, the European Union is the biggest uh, recipient of refugees. So they really want to support the process so that they slow down uh, uh, the influx of refugees. So uh, I think um, this would also contribute to uh, address some of, uh, of other, our other problems, like we have been talking uh, labor shortage. So if we really uh, reintegrate uh, refugees and returnees, then uh, we will contribute to the uh, labor force in, in the country as well. Uh, so I would just like to emphasize, you know, like as a way to address the, the, the issue of depopulation and labor in the country, uh, we, can, uh, uh, we can look into robust uh, reintegration and rehabilitation process. Thank you. Uh, next, I give it to um, Fikre, Fikre, Okay, thank you again. Uh, as Dr. Harna said, there is so many things to say. I'm, I'm excited to say many things, but there's so, so limited time. So I will echo two things here. Uh, one great presentation, and I think each of the presentations deserve a day for, for, for a session for discussions. And, uh, but I'll, I'll go directly to my point. And the capacity building, I think that focus seems to be on higher education uh, uh, in, in the presentation. Early primary education was not discussed, at, and I don't think we can have a very strong tertiary or higher education if we don't have a foundation of uh, primary education capacity building as well. And then the other thing is immediate, immediate uh, human resources. If we're talking about uh, uh, the transitional period or the the, the, about two to three years, uh, we, cannot, we cannot focus on building the infrastructure and then using the, the, the front office to, to, to build the, the, the future institutions. So my, my thinking is the, trans the transitional period will be a great, would be a great time to create a favorable uh, policies, favorable environment for the policies that we are discussing today to be flourish. One, one of the things that I'm thinking is the transitional period, we need to have an emergency plan for it, emergency, emergency economic plan for it. We cannot, we cannot use a, an economic policy that standard used in other countries, other places, in textbooks. We need to have a customized specific theory that puts into, into consideration the Eritrean situation, the Eritrean problem, and have an emergency plan. Within that emergency plan would be creating that favorable environment for the policies that we are discussing today to, be, to, to start and then build institutions of office. Of office. Uh, so one thing that green economy was echoed by many uh, participants here. The other thing that I would like to bring uh, and echo is the infla financial infrastructure. If we don't have the, the, 
the proper financial infrastructure, if we don't have the financing system built in the country, we cannot develop the green economy, we cannot develop other economies. So I think it's uh, almost equally important as the energy infrastructure is important, financial inf infrastructure to build that is also very important. But we need to have an emergency plan for the transition period. Uh, as, as much as these policies are great, the emergency plan needs to be something separate from this or based on this and um, more <coughs> immediate need. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now we'll just have uh, two more. Uh, Sabina, Mohammed. Mohammed. Yes. Mohammed Yahoui. Uh, we only have got, uh, I'm going to give you a 10, just 15 minutes, and that's it. 15 minutes for this session. That's Finish. it for the session now. Oh, yeah, okay, great. That is so fine. just to let you know, we've got 15 minutes. Okay. Thank you, Habib. Okay, uh, Sabina. Uh, regardless, I will keep it short, but I will just say that I really admired uh, your brilliant talks and I learned so much from each of your contributions and even invocations. I was just wondering, um, when we are addressing the idea of the national economy and like uh, re-energizing it or rejuvenating it and having the problem of depopulation, one topic that I thought was missing or not really talked about was reg regional uh, cooperation and economy. I mean, when we think about Germany, right, like, of course, we had the Marshall Plan at a time, but it was also the European Union and actually the idea of expansive politics and trade. Um, and so I was just wondering what the expert group was thinking of that, because that would also really um, have that crucial question on the borders. Right, like if you want to grant mobility not only for goods but also for people, then we really have to rethink what it means to be in a region and also Eritrea as a very geostrategic point. I mean, it has two ports, so I mean, there could be also, and I think Dr. Stein has uh, already talked about it in his um, presentation that. Uh, Eritrea is like between Europe and between Asia and the Silk Road Initiative, so there could be also something about reinventing or rethinking um, the Eritrean economy in terms of trade um, because agriculture seems to be also dying and trade is 90% of the international shipping uh, is carrying, the international shipping is carrying 90% of the world trade. So, um, I mean, two questions in short, one is about regional integration and economy and what the position is to like regional power players like Ethiopia, who really are very strong at the moment um, and powerful. Uh, what the position of Eritrea, of the yeah, uh, what the position of Eritrea would be in that? Um, Thank you very much. And the other one is uh, uh, refocusing or shifting towards port politics and port trade. Thank you very much, Sabina. And I'll go Iyob uh, Fisu. Iyob. Hello again, thank you. Uh, I just want to reiterate again here because uh, most of the presenters and most colleagues are quoting numbers, for example. I don't know where we're getting the numbers. So I think we need the first, I just want to reemphasize the importance of data development because if we don't know where we are, I don't know what we are talking about, quite frankly, because where do we want to go? Well, we should know first where we are. So that needs to be tackled as a policy, as a framework at least, or in any policy or capacity development strategy, that should be the center uh, place because you cannot make policies without uh, proper or reliable data. Well, you can make, but the policies would be misguided. Like, for example, we don't even know how much the population of Eritrea is. Like Mabrato was saying 3.2, some documents will tell you 6.5 million so for me, it's an immediate sort of task. You should do census, and then you should know how many people you have, what is the capacity. We're talking about reintegration and all that. Well, we need to know how many people are unemployed, how many of them are in the labor force, how many of them can be reinstated back to the labor force, then what kind of policies do you need? So I just want to reemphasize the importance of uh, the, the collecting data and knowing where we are, because so far, I, I believe, uh, for the government of Eritrea, it's just more of a secret, which, I mean, GDP should be public knowledge. Okay, right? okay. Thank for you us, it's a mystery. So I just wanted to reiterate that. 
Thank you very much. Uh, you the, the last one will be Abdul Ghadar Daoud. Quickly, please, and then I will give it to David. Okay. If you have any thank you very much. Speak, and then, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to, sorry, I, I just want to say at the, at the outset, uh, I agree, I think it was the uh, Dr. Mabratu about the thematic uh, papers preparation and things and calling for other one, but uh, in respect of that one, I think it's an excellent uh, presentation we heard uh, today. I just wanted to make one in the mining uh, aspect. I think uh, uh, Mabratu, you read, uh, you said the introduction of the uh, social licenses system now for the operation in itself. I think from the environment, and I work for an environmental agency, from the environmental, but not only a social, but we have also the, uh, the, uh, the environmental side of it, especially when you talk about the surface water, groundwater, and arable lands and the contamination, all the things. The license in itself has a lifespan in itself. Uh, so they have to uh, abide by the conditions on those licenses. But for the social side of it, yes, they have to, part of the planning uh, process in itself, they have to consult the local, the locals because they are the one who's going to be impacted by the actual activities. Not only that, but also the permit has to include a guarantee that once they finish the 15 or 20 years period of time, they have to remediate rehabilitate the land in itself to its original sort of conditions. If there is no, because we have quite a number of mining companies and all those things, one of the things, the first thing you do will be to review all those sort of conditions and make it uh, obligatory then for them to, once you review, you will add the conditions that you want and then you can, you, they have to uh, abide by that sort of thing. So I would suggest to, instead of only of social, just an operational introduction and operational license, which in, it will include the social as well as the environmental aspect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Stan, if you have uh, anything to add before I give it to the rest of the, the speakers? Just, just really quickly, I mean, in a way, Sabine has made the point I wanted to make. Uh, you know, there's some fundamental policy questions about how future Eritrea sees itself in the region, both on land and at sea. The region has changed very fundamentally. The region itself is configured um, with the arrival of China uh, globally differently to what it was 25 years ago. Uh, so, you know, there's some big questions there. And I think they link to infrastructure, most obviously in two ways. Firstly, as has been said, in relation to ports, Eritrea could not immediately, but very, very quickly compete not only with Djibouti, but other ports as well. Um, but also in terms of uh, electricity, because, you know, uh, while agreeing with Tuolbi that there is a potential for green energy, there is an abundant supply of cheap energy just next door in Ethiopia. So the most obvious thing is that you import electricity very, very cheaply, hydroelectricity from Ethiopia. Uh, two other very brief points. One, we've only once touched on what happens to PFDJ companies, and that's going to be a very important immediate issue for the new authorities to manage. And I would endorse um, Figaro's point about needing very quickly much, much greatly improved statistics, as well as um, controlling uh, remittance flows and potentially capital flight uh, immediately as a change as well. Thank you, uh, David. And uh, now I give the floor to Tawalde if you have any remarks, and then to Dr. Atubran. Quickly, please, we have just about four minutes or something, so we close up. The uh, organizers have been very generous with us. We have got an additional half an hour. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll be quick. Uh, I think uh, I'll start with Dr. Arar's question, how much would it cost? Um, in terms of numbers, uh, I'm sure we've seen the windmills in the places that we live in. Uh, the total energy capacity in Eritrea today is about 20 of those uh, windmills, 10, 10 to 20, the total capacity today. So you can imagine if we install a thousand of them, we multiply what we have today by a factor of 50 to 100, right? 
And those can cost about a, a billion dollars, right? So a billion dollars sounds uh, big, but it's not really big because the infrastructure will pay for itself in more ways than one. So that's one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is, if we look at um, the issues of climate change today, the whole world is concerned about that. If we can um, package this green energy proposal, we can probably have it built for free. I mean, you know, there are a lot of people concerned about it. Um, and then the huge server farm companies um, can probably build it themselves. So there are different scenarios. I'm, I'm just playing those out um, how affordable it can be. But the diaspora population in, in, uh, in the world, I don't know, we can come up with a billion dollars as an investment to be part of that. So if you build it in scale, you can start with a billion dollars and really build it up. And then tying that to Sabina's uh, question, I think about regional economy or something. Our neighborhood is not a good neighborhood. It's really, you know, a volatile neighborhood. If you can build this infrastructure to generate a vibrant economy for Eritrea and the whole region, then Eritrea can also become a force of peace uh, for, for the region, basically. Um, I, I know I don't have that, uh, much time, but uh, to uh, just, just comment on Dave's, uh, David's uh, last comment, um, the per capita consumption of Eritrea, uh, I mean of Ethiopia, is not that much. So we, you cannot depend on Ethiopia's cheap energy to do the kinds of things that I'm proposing. We need to increase our per capita uh, generation to that of Norway. And I think it's possible. Once you do that, then the infrastructure becomes um, a common infrastructure for the whole region. You can even integrate it into the um, power structure of the whole region, Ethiopia, Kenya, Somalia, and so on, and really become a stabilizing factor for, the, for, the, for this region. The, the concern I have with Ethiopia is Yes, they are generating electricity, but they want to export it to uh, other countries. I don't think that's a good strategy in my opinion, because if you want to be a manufacturing center, whatever pro Ethiopia produces is not even going to be enough for itself, let alone to export to, to, to the neighboring countries. I, I'm, I'm, my, what I'm proposing is to have a robust enough infrastructure where any kind of industry can be built on top of it. Uh, like, uh, like I mentioned earlier, clean, non-polluting, but high energy uh, consuming customers uh, can be the revenue generators that will make this infrastructure pay for itself in a short time. And I think very briefly to Eob's point about data, you're absolutely right. Eritrea, uh, <laughs> it's very, very difficult to get reliable data from Eritrea. So what, what I used for my presentation was what the EU collected when they were um, trying to give 300 million or something for energy generation to Eritrea. So it's more credible, but it's dated. It's from 2014, I believe. But yeah, you're absolutely right. That's why I was saying, once you build this infrastructure, information becomes available and free and your decision-making processes can be more efficient and robust. So yes, data is absolutely important because decisions without good data are, you know, are detrimental. Can I add one point here? Okay, Adios, thank you. Yeah, uh, so maybe uh, like to add a point to what David asked. Um, there is already an initiative uh, which is called like East Africa Powerful like it comprises of like more than 11 uh, countries in North Africa and also in, in East Africa to uh, interconnect their grids. There is this, that initiative, but then like the big question there is also like, you know, like the question of the political stability of the whole region, because, you know, like the, what will happen if somehow the relations go, you know, uh, not as, as expected. So that is one thing. But still, there is uh, that um, 
possibility also like to uh, like Eritrea is the, the only country right now which is not into that powerful but there is like a, a regional uh, like uh, initiative to uh, to interconnect the whole grid of like the East Africa like it, it comprises of like more than 11 countries and then I believe Eritrea can gain something out of it especially like in the short future uh, just as a a consumer, but moving forward, I think we can be like the main contributors and major players in that region. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think time is up. Sorry. Yes. But uh, then you go for, uh, give the floor to you for the summary. Right. The... I will give the floor to uh, Hapte to just uh, close up and uh, make his remarks. Thank you. Hapte, floor, Navaha. I think, Paulos, thank you. I, I think it's uh, Petros who's going to sum up the session. Okay. It was an incredible, really interesting session and really much appreciated all the contributions made. Uh, Petros, are you about? Can I say something just for, for a minute? Yes. Um, uh, Paulos? Yeah, go ahead. But only a yeah, minute. Uh, uh, I think there were um, a few points that were raised, especially with uh, regarding uh, to working together, uh, especially uh, the one that was raised by Professor Araya de Vesai regarding um, uh, with regards to this institute, International Institute of uh, Policy and Strategy, that this uh, team with an Eritrea focus should work with us people that have organized themselves uh, uh, in chapters within the Manifesto 2020. Uh, in a similar line, Dr. Futui Wolde also uh, informed that we should share the blueprint and then we would discuss the different areas of the document. Similarly, Dr. Kiranem and Gustav um, mentioned that the problem is of Eritrea face is structural and uh, policy. And then we need to, to sit together and uh, develop different policy papers for the transition. Um, so like I said at, um, at the start of the presentation, this is only a start and uh, we are going to have uh, various workshops and also we'll, we invite a lot of you uh, to contribute to the discussions and this is not going to be uh, an end in itself. Uh, uh, as uh, mentioned earlier, there are also other groups that have produced documents regards to the transitional economy. There is a Vision 2030. There is a document that was produced by Senate. And now adding to what Professor Ardebesai is mentioning, I think it would be uh, good to work together and uh, develop all the uh, documents. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Maratu. All right, Petros, is he around? He isn't around, so that brings the meeting to a close. Uh, thank you very much.